Hello, everybody. I'm Zias Caravalla, Principal Analyst of ZK Research, and uh, we're back for another uh, Zcast video. And as always, this video is done in conjunction with EVC Speaks. And I'm here again with my co-host, Mark Reed Edwards. Uh, Mark, we're at the one-year anniversary of the pandemic, so I don't know what that means, just that uh, we've been sheltering in place a year, I guess. So. Yeah, I've been sitting in this office uh, for one year nonstop. That's what it means. Well, if you shelter for two weeks, we'll be okay. Well, I'll go away, so. <laughs> so a lot of stuff going on every week. We say that every week, and that's because there always is a lot of stuff going yeah. on. And an interesting thing happened. Uh, McAfee sold its enterprise business to Symphony Technology Group, which also owns RSA. Can you dig into that a little bit? Yeah. Four billion, right, is what they got for it. So I this, uh, this caught me by surprise. I knew McAfee... There had been rumors that they'd sell off the consumer business. I didn't think they'd sell off the enterprise business. But, it, you know, if you look, it makes some sense uh, based on the growth rates and things like that. So uh, it's, it, it's funny because the, the sale comes five months after McAfee went public on NASDAQ, right? They had been a private company for a long time. Uh, I think the last time they were publicly traded was 10 years ago. Uh, now, the company IPO to 20 it uh, fell below 20 for quite a while and then hovered around 20 and the stock didn't really move. In fact, the acquisition news is the biggest bump the stock's gotten since they've been public. And so the, the company is, um, has actually invested quite a bit since it spun out you know, from Intel. Yeah, earlier this year, it put together its XDR framework. Uh, it's got a pretty good SIM uh, as well, but uh, for whatever reason, they, they, they chose to sell it off. Now, I will say, if you look at the CEO, Peter Leave, he was also the guy that orchestrated the Polycom deal. And so he's a guy that, you know, when you look at his track record, is there to maximize shareholder value. And given they got such a big, big premium, you know, price, $4 billion, um, you know, obviously Wall Street liked it quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm assuming he took it to maximize shareholder value. So McAfee Enterprise goes over, as you mentioned, to a, a private equity firm called Symphony Technology Group that last year bought... Uh, RSA from Dell for $2 billion. And so if you look at the trends in security, Mark, it has been for the bigger vendors to get bigger. Cisco, Fortinet, Palo Alto, uh, even Juniper to some extent have all brought, gotten bigger portfolios. The big driver for that, of course, is something that in 2018, I believe I was the first analyst to use this term, you know, XDR, which is extended detection response, which is the concept of that you can't have uh, you know, a product that's solely endpoint focused or network focused or cloud focused can't, maybe it'll help you find a threat, but it won't help you respond to it because it doesn't know where in the attack chain it happened. So in that regard, breadth matters more. I, so I, I do think it's, you know, from a customer perspective, the ability to take the McAfee technology and merge it with RSA is probably good for the, the old McAfee customers. I don't know what the new company's going to be called. For the consumer business, and uh, that includes a lot of different products, right? It's the McAfee uh, Total Protection Antivirus, McAfee VPN, they got Web Advisor, uh, they have, uh, I think, some gamer services as well. It's a pretty big market, about $20 billion TAM. Um, you know, for, for McAfee here, they've actually got some, I, I think consumer is very difficult to compete in because it's, you know, a lot of these services are being offered from the cloud, but they do have some good assets. So, you know, for instance, they cut a five year deal, deal with Asus. To have their products built in their uh, embedded on their products. They signed a three-year deal with LG to have a pre-installed version uh, for 30 days on LG, LG devices. They renewed an agreement with Costco. And so they're well set up in consumer. Also, the consumer business, uh, if you look at the last quarter, uh, numbers grew 23% um, uh, year over year, where enterprise only grew 5%. So the growth is in the consumer business. And so from that regard, I think it makes what they did make some sense. I also think that it, it, if you look historically, Mark, I'm, I'm surprised they lasted as a combined company for that long because it's it's very difficult to run a company that services both consumers and enterprises because the needs are so different. You know, Cisco tried to do consumer, they got out. Right? Google's been trying to go enterprise, uh, you know, on the app side, but a lot of their stuff tends to be used by you know kids in school. Uh, Microsoft even never really became a big consumer brand. Xbox certainly is, but certainly not the Microsoft brand. You know, Dell may be the one company that bridges both. HP had a disastrous time with consumers, right? So it's it's very difficult to do that. And so this allows the, what's left of McAfee to be laser focused on consumer. It allows the enterprise group to go over to a company that's more focused on that. And so I think this winds up being a, you know, a win-win. I, I do think the, 
you know, what happens to Mac the consumer is going to be interesting just because it is, that, that is a very competitive market. You do wind up competing a lot on price. I did, by the way, just as a funny aside, I did notice that uh, John McAfee, uh, the founder of McAfee, who's not, I want to make this clear, is not affiliated with the McAfee company, hasn't been for a long time, but he's in legal trouble again. I think he's doing some funny business with cryptocurrency. So if you ever watch the bio on that guy, it's hilarious. So he, uh, it's boy, it's, frightening. He's, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, crazy. he took his money and um, yeah, he he took his money and decided he was going to not just retire but to do everything illegal he could apparently. <laughs> All right, well, moving right along, VMware and Nvidia are getting together on a GPU virtualization platform. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, this was a this was a fascinating offering. You know, if you look at AI in the enterprise. Um, even, you know, in schools and scientific institutions, it's largely a bunch of software that you have to put together and run on bare metal because you, you need the performance. And the two companies together uh, now have simplified the deployment of all that software would make a turnkey and you can run it on, on the latest version of vSphere, which is uh, vSphere 7 Update 2, I believe. And the companies claim that you'll get performance that's not quite what it is on bare metal, but so close that it's that it's indistinguishable. And that's great from an IT perspective because you know when you had departments buy an AI, you could you could actually have you know this department buy their own hardware or this department buy its own hardware and they're they're not shared resources, right? So you know you know data science scientists were buying their own. Now that AI has become a lot more mainstream, you see IT having to take that role on. And so the concept of being a service, a shared service organization, you know, becomes true. And they use VMware to distribute these types of services. And so what NVIDIA's new offering is, it's called AI Enterprise. And it's a complete turnkey software suite that's got all the tools and software and, you know, everything you're going to need to do AI, but it runs on VMware vSphere. And so it makes it portable. You can move it, you know, you can use vMotion to move it around. You can deploy it very quickly in different locations. And so it brings it, you know, more in line to where IT is. Uh, you can also run it in the cloud if you want using VMware Cloud Foundation. And so, you know, almost any company from healthcare to manufacturing to financial services or whatever that is looking to do AI can do this. The big benefit, of course, with, with it being all software based on VMware is you bring the deployment time down. Um, um, instead of having to tweak and tune the hardware and software, uh, typically you'll see deployment times of two, three months. Uh, they're saying a week now, right? So, because uh, everything's all pre-configured. And the one thing I think that goes underappreciated about NVIDIA is they have been masterful in putting these systems together. So they're not, people think of NVIDIA as a silicon company, but they're a systems company, right? You look at their drive kit. It's a GPU-based little mini computer that goes in a car, right? They've got Clara, which is a uh, a pre-built computer with all the software and things that you're going to need on it that goes into healthcare. They've got the same thing for ray tracing. They've got the same thing for machine learning, right? So what they've been good at is understanding how to deploy these things and how to optimize it. And they sell customers a complete solution. And this is yet another example of it. So they are, you know, they, 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 they win the Silicon Wars because they understand how to package things better than an Intel or an AMD. And it's like the GPU is now the point of integration for a lot of things. Yeah, well, the GPU is, uh, you know, the, it's been well documented for a while that Moore's Law is running out of steam. And it's not just, you know, I know Jensen Huang, their CEO, has been very vocal saying that. And people might think that's very self-serving. I've heard Cisco talk about that. I've heard Juniper talk about that, right? It's not, you know, Moore's Law is coming to an end because we can only put so many transistors on a piece of silicon. And so what the GPU does, it's a fundamentally different type of architecture in which it allows you to do parallel computation for these very heavy uh, processor intensive workloads. And so the term accelerated computing is what they use. And it truly is that it makes computing faster because it's done differently instead of being single threaded, you know, it's, it's uh, a whole bunch of things can be done in parallel, which is why gamers love it, right? Because you get a whole different experience. Yeah, it's like last week uh, we were talking about Cisco. You know, modulating the uh, the frequencies in the fiber to to jam more signal in, and and that's right. Know, it, it's you know, but at some point you come up against the physical limits. Yeah, you do right, and that's that's the thing people have talked about. Is there a way to make silicon faster? But there's it's, it's you know that you were, were Moore's law is running out of steam, and so the GPUs. Yeah. 
is taken over as the primary compute unit for all these processor and heavy uh, intensive workloads. But if it's so complicated to deploy that nobody can bring all the software hardware together, then it does very few companies any, you know, it only benefits a handful of companies. And so VMware and, and uh, NVIDIA partnered together to make this much simpler, not just for, you know, a, a few companies, but for really any company that wants to do AI. Yeah. AT&T is uh, going to start using Fortinet for their SD-WAN. Yeah, Fortinet is really, uh, I think, an in, in underappreciated security vendor. I've long liked Fortinet because the price performance they get is off the charts. In fact, I remember seven, eight years ago talking to the engineers at Hughes. And if you're familiar with Hughes, they're a very technical company. Uh, almost to the point where they really know how to market. <laughs> but any product that they use, you know, is really good. And they were telling me they evaluated so many different vendors and they, they love Fortinet. Fortinet is also used by Masergy uh, as part of their SASE foundation. And they offer great price performance. And the, the way they go to market is, uh, it's funny, we were just talking about silicon with NVIDIA. So if you think about what a GPU is, it's a piece of silicon that's optimized for graphics or really accelerated computing today. Fortinet spins its own silicon, and they call it a security processing unit. So it's a piece of silicon that's optimized for security things. And so it's going to do a better job than just off-the-shelf silicon, right? And so uh, it's, a, it's a very you know, similar thought process. And so by spinning their own silicon, they have a lot of consistency of features and policies and things across products. Now, you, know, you juxtapose that with a company like Palo Alto that buys through acquisition, Palo has been you know, doing great. I'm not going to take anything from them, but there is a lot of integration work they have to do. With Fortinet, all the stuff's built into silicon, so they do get very good price performance. The AT&T announcement, the AT&T announced that they're going to be using Fortinet for their managed SASE service. And um, the one thing about Fortinet is they're very strong in both networking and security. So I think they can provide, help them with the network connectivity, but also you know, offering a, a full range of uh, security services. Uh, Fortinet's actually... They, they've historically been a not invented here company, but they've, they've cut a bunch of partnerships uh, in the SASE space to fill in holes, things that they don't have. So they use BitGlass, they use Zscaler. Um, and so they've, they've done a nice job of rounding out the portfolio that way. AT&T, again, is another company that's very technically astute. And so I think they're choosing Fortinet as a big feather in their cap. So Mobile World Congress supposedly happening in June. If you look back a year ago, it was one of those first early indicators that something was going on in the world that was not good with the pandemic. And, you know, the the companies uh, were pulling out of it, you know, this time last year. And now uh, it's supposedly happening in June, but Nokia, Sony, Ericsson, and Oracle are all pulling out. So what's yeah. going on there? Yeah, Huawei's still in. I, I It's... Um... Um, and a few other companies are in. I, I, I think the conference is going to cancel. I ran a very unofficial poll on Twitter and I asked people, are you, would you go or would you not? Uh, it was two thirds, one third, no. I was surprised the yes was actually one third. Uh, somebody replied to me, where's the are you crazy button? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that gives you a sense of some people's feelings. Um, I, I under, it, it's an interesting you know, thing to ask, wh which is going to be the first big conference we have? Who wants to be the guinea pig? You know, what are the rules of engagement going to be? Right now, I don't think they've got any limitations. I don't think they say you have to be vaccinated, things like that. Uh, I'm not sure that I'd want to be, be comfortable going to the, you know, I love traveling, I love events, but I'm not sure I'd want to be the first one. So if, um, if, I, gotta put, if I had to bet money on it, I would say that any conference that happens, you know, pre-July is probably going to wind up getting canceled. I would think Mobile World Congress is. And one of the issues is Marcus' travel budget. I, every time I talk to a CEO or an HR person about their company, I ask what kind of, you know, how have you built your travel budget into this year? And almost all of them tell me they got nothing allocated for the first half. And then they got a little bit in the second, you know, the third quarter and a little bit more in the fourth quarter. So I would think it's a, it'd be a stretch for companies to actually go to mobile Congress, even if they wanted to. So, you know, uh, good on them. I know um, Enterprise Connect is scheduled for September, of this year, I think that at least has some shot of happening live. Actually, they just had their virtual event and they sent out a poll to all the attendees asking, would you go, would you not go? So I think even they're thinking about it and wanting to get a pulse on it. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but I do think we'll see events change too. I, I think you'll see, at least for the meantime, be a little shorter. But I do know people love events. 
you get to see a whole bunch of people you never got you have you don't get to see every year uh, all at once but the, to me that's a very aggressive timeline for mobile Congress. Uh, anyways mark uh, you know as always we say this every week there's lots of news i'm sure there's gonna be there's lots of news next week so make sure you click the subscribe and uh, on behalf of mark reed edwards i'm zias caravala thank you very much